forget that we are humans and the fact that we're giving so much. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is episode 272. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and I'm Jeremy. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder of this company, and I'm the guy that got tired of the sparring gear out there and said, hey, let's do better. You can find all of our products at whistlekick.com. You can find the show notes for this episode and all of the others at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode over there for free. No banner ads, no subscriptions, no junk like that. If you want to support us, you support us. If you just want to listen to the show, that's fine too. We're happy to have you along on this journey as we get to talk to some amazing martial artists like today's guest, Sensei David Hughes from Australia. And on today's episode, as we're talking to Sensei Hughes, you might hear a bit of a different format, or to be perfectly honest, a lack of format. See, Sensei Hughes was one of the casualties of some technical issues that we had a few weeks ago, and we ended up re-recording his episode. But because we had this wonderful context, we'd already had a great chat, we started right from the get-go. There was no pre-chat that you don't get to hear. We just jumped into it. And it was an incredible discussion. I had a lot of fun doing it. And you might hear more conversations like this in the future. So thank you to Sensei Hughes for inspiring this step away from what we do often. And today we talk about practically everything we've done in our journeys in the martial arts. From his talk about time in theater to what might happen at retirement and teaching Kyokushin Karate. Let's all welcome him. Hello, says a Hughes. Well, it's mine. How are you? Sorry, I missed your call before. No, it's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> so I called back. I, uh, I'm, I'm still at work, obviously, so I'm sort of walking around, and I, I have a sign on, so <laughs> Anyway, how are you? I'm doing well. How about you? Good, mate. Yeah, a bit of a yeah. bummer about the uh, last interview, but yeah. The, uh, yeah, it, anyway, it's a good it, chance for us to have another chat. That's right. We we get a wonderful excuse to talk again, and and yeah. you know uh, there have been a couple times in the history of the show that we've repeated for for various reasons. You know, um, mm. you know audio quality early on, or you know somebody just wasn't happy with with the way they they said things. And in every case, it's a small set, but in every case, it came out better the second time. So I'm really fully expecting. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm fully expecting oh. that we're going to blow the doors off this time. Excellent. Yeah, it's kind of like well, it's like a full dress rehearsal, as they say, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great way to look at it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, I, I'm, I come from a uh, musical theatre background when I was a kid. Oh, okay. I don't and, think we talked about I, that last time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah, I, I, I spoke to you a little bit about music, but um, sure. I was probably the, the only straight guy in in the whole sort of, <laughs> in the industry, but um, yeah, I, I I remember I always used to think to myself full dress rehearsals are um, they're a waste of time. You know, I was only young, but <clears throat> when I um, started training in in karate, I realised that um, the you know when you're training for a fight, the best way they've found to train to a fight for a fight. And people ask me all the time, oh, what do you, how do you train for a fight? The only answer to that question is just fight a lot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it makes so sense. So I, I, <clears throat> I just tell the guys pad up and just go hard. You know, just just do everything that that, that your uh, competition would throw it. That you have a lot of different training partners and just you can run, you can hit the bag, you can skip rope, you can eat right. All those things are not going to get you ready for a fight as much as fighting a lot. And that's it. It's only secret. <laughs> that that analogy, just with with theater, with a dress rehearsal, that mm. really resonates for me. I mean, I, I I can see a lot of correlation there with whether it's it's performance martial arts, you know, doing a kata in front of people, or yes. whether it's a fight. Because it, it's your. I mean, I didn't participate in theater, but I had a number of friends who did, and and the attempt to kind of recreate that next level through the full dress rehearsal. That's it's why it's a dress yeah. rehearsal, not just yeah. everybody running through the lines top to bottom. You're trying to simulate that yeah. full experience. But, but you know, the funny thing is, I was actually thinking about this recently with the Olympics, right? Now, these people are pushing themselves beyond, you know, probably human 
expectation at their training sessions. But the thing is, the, the times they break the records is when they're actually at the Olympics. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's kind of hard to, to verbalise and, and sort of get that idea of what I'm sort of saying across. But the thing, these people, they train every day, all day. and But the time that they break the record is when they're in that competition. So they're training full dress rehearsal all the time. So what is what is it? What's the thi- what is the the X factor in that? What's the thing that pushes them to that next level when they actually get to that competition? I think it's the desire to perform or or to to excel in front of others. I don't yeah, know if you've ever we... had the experience performing something. Well, I mean, theater, right? In front of people, mm. and you want to yeah. do your best. And, and I think the people that don't respond to that pressure don't end up doing those sorts of things. No, I think you're 100 percent right. You know, that that's what, I was. I was hoping that you'd come to the same conclusion. Uh, it was it was almost a loaded question because um, <laughs> I passed the test. You know, <laughs> just, <laughs> just, I see how it is. <laughs> okay, hang on. let me just fill out my form here. Okay, sure. question one. Check that box. Pass, uh, <laughs> B plus. <laughs> B plus. Oh, man, you're tough. You're a tough you, grader. You, you didn't, yeah, because I've got a little text that says, did he elaborate enough on the answer? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, no, I'll save just... that for later on. Hopefully there's some extra credit. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, how have you been? I've been well. I've been well. I, I just took my first vacation in four and a half years yes you said that you were doing that and yeah. had, where did you go uh we were in florida and we, oh we, nice me and three buddies we trailered our motorcycles down and we drove straight through 24 hours got mm-hmm. there Do you we unloaded the, the bikes no no i drive a sport bike a, a what a, a, a sport bike it's a yamaha oh sports bike right okay yeah yeah, um, yeah, good Japanese bike. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah um, Florida, I actually was I, in 2002, I, was, I went down to Florida um, at a vacation. My girlfriend at the time, his grandmother lived down there from, and mm. they call them snowbirds, you'd know that. You yes. know, they go, they fly south for the winter and uh, lived in a little trailer park. And my understanding of a trailer park in america was um not great before i actually went there but it was actually really nice it was just full of lots of lovely old people playing cards and shuffling around in walking frames in the sun putting on sun you know, not sunscreen uh lotion to tan up and <laughs> it yeah, nice, it's, it's a it's a whole different world and a lot of them have age requirements the park that my grandparents used to live in and, and then you know my, my mother's inherited the home it's a 55 years and right. older park yeah. so i'm not allowed to go stay there unless she's there wow that's uh yeah. th- that would be broaching on uh discriminatory discriminatory laws wouldn't it it's it's an interesting kind of i don't know if i want to say loophole but you know it's completely legal and it's stuff that florida has set up because mm. you know, they're trying to trying to set it up for for the people that they want and and it, I guess it works. Well, you know, in here, in Australia, we have retirement villages, which I imagine you would have the same thing, which is like a a, a small sort of um, setup of, of of granny flat home homes, and um, they they stay there, sort of in independent living units and stuff. Mm. And um, you have to be over sixty five to access that. So I guess you know, it would it would have to be the same with trailer parks. Same idea. Same idea. Do you think you'll ever end up in one of those? Um, live fast, die young. <laughs> oh yeah. No, no way. I've got kids. No way. Um, my um, wife is uh, fourteen years younger than me, so I've actually promised her that she can, uh, and she's a nurse as well. So I've actually okay. promised her that she'll get to look after me when uh, when I'm older. So, That's so just kind as of a you. bonus. Just as a bonus, you know, <laughs> she she can walk, push me around in my wheelchair, and you know. Now, how many years of retirement have have you promised her in between? You know. Oh, um, I haven't promised her any. I mean, we didn't really get into that that side oh, okay. of the verbal contract. 
It was so all it, about it, me. It, she it she may go. <laughs> <laughs> she may go from taking care of everyone else to taking care yeah. of you, or God forbid, there's even overlap. Hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> we can only we we can only live in hope, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Do you do you have much experience with with the older set and and martial arts training? And I, I don't I don't mean older as in you know forties and fifties. I mean you know sixty, seventy, eighty. Not, not really. Um, I, I, I don't, only I don't because um, I'm sure you know. I mean, you, we spoke last time. You know, you, you have a a background with uh, Kyokushin and um, the, an understanding of what we do. I, I think, um, you know, not to be offensive to anyone, but but you know, it's it's a, probably one of the toughest styles around. Um, yeah. physically demanding and uh, the amount of contract, contact we use, <clears throat> excuse me, um, w- like we were talking about before, the full dress rehearsal and, you know, people people basically putting themselves into the firing line to test themselves to get ready um, for a fight. That's how we train all the time. You know, so, so generally, you know, I haven't had too many people... Um, these days, you know, everyone Googles you before they come in. <clears throat> so they, they have an understanding of what you're doing. And I don't think they get past that first um, that first um, Google search. You know, you put pop Kilkish in in, in uh, YouTube and see what you get. It's all people getting KO'd all over the place. So, you know, that, if you were 65 plus, you're not going to be going, oh, yeah, that, that looks like a good retirement plan. I mean, that looks like a good healthcare plan, but um, it's not a very good retirement plan, is it? No. Do you think that's a liability? Do you think there's... There's a downside because, you know, if somebody walks in off the street, if they're interested, if they don't know, you know, Kyokushin from, from Goju, from Tai Chi, and they walk in off the street, mm-hmm. you can talk to them. And, and obviously there's going to be some individualization. You know, what's hard for one person, I'm assuming you allow that in your school, what's hard mm-hmm. for one person isn't necessarily the same for somebody else, but you kind of miss out having that that individual conversation and, and setting those expectations. Hmm. Um, look, um, Kelshin has changed so much um, in the almost 30 years I've been training. It, it used to be, the mindset used to be, um, and, and this is a part of the culture of the toughness of, of what, and, you know, I've got to thank the people that have come before me for for teaching me these lessons and showing me these things, but it was basically you either kept up and you took the beatings, because um, it was basically toe to toe. It wasn't a lot of intelligence in it in those days, um, and you either copped it or you left. And it was sort of like a, it was like almost um, like a pack mentality. You know, it was like you know the alpha male would come in, and you know, but it's changed a lot these days. We've become a lot smarter, so so it's more of an inc- inclusion than an exclusion um, mm-hmm. syllabus that we try to do these days. So, you know, we spoke briefly last time um, about um, Hajime Kazumi, who was probably one of the greatest Kyokushin fighters of all time. And uh, um, a recent interview that I saw with him, and he very rarely practices um, kumite and sparring. He actually does kata nearly all, you know, he, he's broken away from Kyokushin and started his own style. But this guy was one of the the best all time fighters in Kyogoshin. He's branched away and he he's actually in an interview that I saw um that he had online with Nicholas Pettis. He says, um, karate is just kata. You know, that 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 he he summoned up karate with that. So I'm talking around in a big circle to get to the point. Basically is um these days, yes, and as a as a as an instructor that has come through the old way, and you know, I'm looking at doing my fourth Dan grading soon. Um, you know, I'm 45 years old, um, and it doesn't get easier; it gets tougher. The system gets tougher as it goes, so it's sort of almost you know counterproductive because you know you 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 you're training towards a um, a goal. Um, that is expecting more from you, but your body is slowly getting worn down. So I 
personally try to encourage students to participate in Kyokushin for whatever reason they want. You know, you don't have to be a full top contact fighter. You don't have to be a kata expert. You don't have to have a full understanding of, you know, all the basics and all sort of things. You should have the good meal. Did, did I talk to you about the good meal analogy last time? Mm, I don't remember. Let's, well, let's do it again. I think, well, I, I think as, a, as an instructor, you know, we have an obligation to be inclusive, to include everyone now, that nowadays, you know, not just to go only only the strongest will survive. You know, you want different students to, from different backgrounds, from, you know, different age groups, blah, 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 to enrich your club. So, um, you know, I, I think when you're teaching, you need to give, you know, the, you need to give the, the first course, you need to give, you know, like a, an entree or maybe some canapes or something beforehand. And then, you know, then you have your main course and then you have your you know, dessert, and you have an after-dinner mint. And, and the analogy for that is the way you should teach a class. You know, you, you have the main meat of what you're doing, but you've got to have a lots of other little things roughly on the same theme. You're not, Mexi- you're not mixing Mexican and Italian. You know, you've got to have a theme that goes through. But, you know, you know my classes might consist of, um, you know, an introductory thing that will lead on to the main course. It will lead on to um, something nice and and playful, whimsical at the end, and then we finish off with something something strong but but um, very short. Um, and then then we finish, and the students should feel like they've got lots of aspects, including the emotional, uh, you know, psychological, spiritual aspects of what you're teaching. How much prep work do you put into planning your classes? Um, I, I'm a, I am a, um, habitual plagiarizer. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, so, um, and I think this comes back to being a musician, you know, when musicians write songs, you know, it, you, you can't write something original. Um, and, and when it comes to martial arts, you know, there's only so many ways you can th- throw a right cross and a knee right. and a roundhouse kick to the head. You know, you, you know there's... You can't reinvent the way the you know the dynamics and the, the physical sort of you know limitations of the human body. So um, once again, big way to answer your question. But I put a lot of prep. But you know, I might be working currently on say four or five different classes from you know YouTube mm. clips or articles that I've read, read or magazines that I've gone through, and I'll be taking bits and pieces and putting together a theme for a class. Um, and then something will happen. I will see something you know, namely on YouTube, and, and go, oh, yes, that all aligns. There you go, that's one class. You know, I guess it's like a, a songwriter sitting down and writing a verse, and then they'll write a part of a chorus, and they'll, they'll hear a song go, oh, there's a second verse. And, you know, they, they put, and then <clears throat> they t- turn around one day, I mean, and, and uh, go, uh, there you go, I've got a song, I'll put it together. So I guess that that's my way, that's the way I do it. Um, mm. But um, I do... I don't sit there all day and go through a class. I would have been working on a class maybe for six months. Um, but I mean, you know, like, that sounds actually quite gratuitous. It's, I mean, that's not really... Um, I'm not sitting there, you know, six months going home every night after work and writing things down. I'm just no, at no, a, no, I, a I, conscious I, level putting it yeah. together, you know? <clears throat> um, and, when you're, and then the pennies when you're doing When you're doing that planning... Are you looking at, you know, themes across, say, weeks, months, quarters, years? Or does each class kind of stand on its own? Or, or is it both? <clears throat> you know, I don't know well, a lot of people who plan classes, because I, I never have been one of those people. And to my knowledge, mm. very few of my instructors mm. were ever the type that would plan classes. It, maybe they would, you know, on the way in to the school, they would think about, oh, let's see, what should we work on today? You know, there might yeah. be some reflection on the, the last couple of classes, but planning cool. is, you know, just it's never been in my teaching vocabulary. So I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. curious. No, I, I, you know what? I'm, you know, to be really honest, I'm, I'm like that. You know, I'll, I will be okay. often, you know, during the day of the class, I'll be putting things together. <clears throat> and there's so many other factors because, you know, I've obviously got to marry it all back with the syllabus with what is actually, you know, Kelkshin is what I teach. You know, so for me to put in an aspect around, you know, Krav Maga or, or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or something like that, um, the students 
<clears throat> I don't think they would be as open to it because it's not, you know, although it is teaching them some new skills, um, it's not really marrying it back with the syllabus which they had been tested on. So realistically, we are teaching them our syllabus. We're te- you know, so every class should be married back with that. <clears throat> but um, mm. I'm, I'm exactly the same as you. you know, I'll, I'll, put, I'll have these ideas floating um, during the day or on the way to that class. I'll go, oh, that idea marries with that one, blah, 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 blah. It all matches back with the syllabus and what I'm expected to be teaching. Um, and then, and, and by the time I get there, it's, it all just gels together. But what I generally find, Jeremy, and I probably you probably do the same, is I usually have too much content. Um, the things that I, you know, I have so many things. I'm like, you think I'll be better at my time management by now? But I'll be like, um, you know, towards the end of an hour and a half class, I'll go. Uh, I actually had six other things I wanted to do, but that's going to have to wait until next week. You know, um, so, <clears throat> um, but I think it's good. It's better to have more content than, than not enough. Yeah. You know, I, and you that's, don't want to go, that's always, uh, let's go early. <laughs> exactly. And that's always been my approach because you never know, you know, just <laughs> and for anybody out there that has not run a class, you might not realize this, but the dynamic can shift so dramatically based on who's there and the mood that they're in that night. <clears throat> oh, man. So, yeah, is, you know, I, I was I was teaching a kid's class last night. You know, I'll, I'll go in and work with my Taekwondo instructor, and he'll usually split the class and give me, mm-hmm. you know, usually the higher ranks, and he'll take the lower ranks. Yeah. And last night they were just a disaster, an utter disaster. They they There was one kid who, you know, is fairly new to the class. He came in from another school, dramatic behavior problems. And, just, and we have a very open, very... Um, kind of relaxed culture with a lot of mm. things. And he brought everybody down with him. Mm. You know, so there were things that we would start working on and I, I would just abandon it within five minutes and move on to something wow. else, move on to something else until I found the thing that engaged everyone well enough mm. that, you know, we could, we could get something done. Mm. I, I've had that happen before. Um, and, and well, <clears throat> this really emphasises the, um, you know, the influence that we have on our students for a start, but also um, that our, I guess, you know, there's only one way of putting it, you know, is the respect and manners that go with, you know, traditional martial arts. Um, that as relaxed as we are is, the, is, is as relaxed as our students are going to become. And that's a perfect example that, yeah, you said that you're relaxed, but obviously this guy was crossing a lot of boundaries. I mean, how 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 old are we talking? Like a six year old or something? I think eight, seven, <clears throat> eight. <clears throat> yeah, right. Um, but you know, if he had a started at your school, went to another school, he would have understood that there was boundaries and there was, you know, there were certain things that weren't acceptable behaviours. Um, you know, and this a lot of parents don't get this <clears throat> that you know we're not teaching their kids how to beat someone up. You know, I say to people often. You know, you may get in one physical contest in your whole life, um, and you've already got a 50% chance of winning that. So, you know, so why don't you just save, if that's the only reason you're coming in, save your money, save your time, stop going out at night time in your pyjamas, and, <laughs> um, and, and, um, and just take your chances, you know. But that, but that is not the reason, and most people get that after a while, but, you know, um, that you know, so, particularly with kids, you know, we're teaching them how to be better people. Um, but what what has re- had has had to happen for myself after those sort of classes is a serious conversation with the parent, you know, and say, listen, you know, we've got a lot of work to do here, um, and I, you know, and and you know, I'm only willing to try this for you know maybe two more classes. Yeah. Otherwise, little Johnny's going to have to move on, you know. But the thing is, you know. The horse is bolted. <laughs> you, you, you're going to try to pull back in um, manners that other people didn't instill in the first place. Right, right, and, and I don't know that I can I can make a broad stroke of the brush when I say this, but at least a large portion of the time, if you remove the parents from the from the room, those kids act a lot better. You, you, you know, know it's what? it's I, entrenched behavior. Looking for that response from them, they know they're I acting mean, out. But if they're not going to get that that feedback, 
from the parent, which all too often I see comes from a home where that's the only sign of, of value that those kids are getting. Yep. yep. You know, if we can, t- if we can break that chain to say, Hey mom and or dad, get the hell out. Mm. Yep. The kid looks around and realizes, Oh, this is the only person who is going to give me any validation. Yeah. And as yeah. long as the instructor yeah. strong enough to lay praise, it tends mm. to work out. I agree. Oh, my, my jury's still out with the old, um, the old, you know, eternal question of parents in the room or parents outside the room. I, I in um, my new dojo, I think I told you last time I was opening opening a uh, full time dojo here. Yeah. In Perth. Um, yeah. How's that going? And we've been open for a couple of couple of weeks now, which is it's going brilliantly. But awesome. um, I've got one area inside of the dojo where we've got some bean bags at the back. Right. And then next to the dojo is a room, a small room that comes out, reception room, where we put some um, comfy chairs in there. Now, some parents are happy to sit there and play on their phone and catch up on Facebook and social media and whatever. Other parents are very engaged. But the thing is, um, currently, and it seems to be working okay at this present time, is, is I have a conversation with the parent and I actually lay ground rules with them. Um, and... You know, to to say, look, you know, the, the when you're in the club, we, you know, we don't clap when little Johnny does something that he's told, you know, and we don't say, okay, you know, we'll take you to McDonald's after because that was awesome, you know. <laughs> that you, if you if you're in the class, you're a guest, and it's a it's a it's a privilege, it's not a right. Um, and and I have asked people to leave the room before, um, but basically they sit there, they and you know. You, they want to be part of what their kid's doing. They're quite proud and they're actually assisting them outside of the class to, you know, to learn whatever the techniques or kata or whatever that we're doing. So, you know, that they're active participants in the class with, with just taking in that knowledge and helping their child partake. And then you get other parents that really just, they drop them off and, you know, they just want to hang around, have a coffee and, and do their own thing. Um, so I think we're going to, you know, personally I separate the parents in, with a an interview that they don't even realise they're having, mm. um, and then and then you know I encourage them. I say, "Oh, you sit out there," <laughs> you know. But I do say, if you're going to be in here, these are some things that we sort of expect in a nice, polite way. Yeah, I, I've I've even heard of schools that have I don't want to say like a contract for the parents, but here's what's expected of you and your family at home or or mm. outside of class. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, had a, I had a situation, and I finally calmed down enough from it that I can I can share it. And this was <laughs> this is probably a month ago, maybe even six weeks, that I was there. I was helping with a class, and quite often the instructor gets there a little bit late because of his day job, and 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 that's fine. And you know, we'll usually give him a little bit of leeway. But if I'm there, you know, I'm not there every class. But if I'm there, I'll get the kids lined up and and start with a warm up and everything. And this was this was another particular day where the kids were just chaotic. You know, it was, uh, I think it might have been a vacation day from school. So, you know, they were off doing their own thing, out of their routine. And I tell them to line up, and, and none of them do. So my voice elevates, you know, I, I, I get louder. And there was this one particular kid who I hadn't met before, but very clearly had been there at least a few times, and he wasn't wasn't listening. So here I am. I've I've basically yelled at these kids. They're starting to come into line, and and this one is near me. And I put my hand on his shoulder, and I say, "It's time to line up." And Dad comes off his chair and says, "Don't you dare touch my kid." Oh well. Wow. And I went, "Oh, this is new." You know, mm. I'd, I'd never had a circumstance like that before. Mm. You know, and then the the instructor is the only one who gets to touch my kid, and I'm like. Oh. Okay, sorry. And then I spent the rest of the class trying to teach and failing miserably at working with this this six-year-old and not giving him physical feedback. Wow. Because yeah, kids, that's they, don't, they don't have the language skills. You know, take the foot, manipulate it, you know, do it. That's how I teach, and I tend to get pretty good results from that. And, yeah, but uh, adults are like that too sometimes. <laughs> you know? abso- oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Would, you know, I, for me, the difference with between kids and adults is adults have more potential ways of learning. Kids yeah. really just have repetition. Exactly. 
you got to put them in a Definitely. certain place and say, do this and do this again and mm. do it this mm. again and again and again. And eventually they start to correlate that action with that word. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Agree. How did you deal with that, though? It sounds like it sort of affected you and you've um, gone on the bad taste. Well, I think it affected me because I'm, you know, I, I don't get paid to go help teach. I do it because mm. I love it. You know, I, I love the school. I love the kids. I love my instructor. Yep. And here was someone who clearly was expressing a, a lack of faith of, of my, my reasoning. You know, they, they, they didn't trust. trust. Yeah. They mm-hmm. didn't trust mm-hmm. why I was doing that. You know, and it was very clear. I, you know, I, I hadn't harmed the child. You know, I didn't punch him. You know, I, mm-hmm. I didn't put my hand on him with any kind of force or malice. But I think his guard was up because I was yelling. And the instructor mm. does not generally raise his voice. You know, it's just a difference in my style. Mm. And I think that well, that struck yeah. him as odd. And then, you know, to make contact, he's going, whoa, I don't know this guy. He's yelling at kids. He's Now his hand's <clears> on my kid. What's next? And, and well, you know, I, I, I had a lot of respect for him, you know, in, in a sense, doing what you know, most people wouldn't have done, you know, he was feeling defensive of his child. And so I went over to him and I said, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I shook his hand Mm -hmm. and I said, I won't. Now, obviously that went out the window, not intentionally because I, I lost track of which kid was his Mm -hmm. as I'm working with the children later on, because, you know, this, this is a, a a class that has a fair amount of white and yellow belts and, and, you Mm -hmm. know, young kids tend to flow through like water. You know, there might be three or four Kids <clears throat> swapped out, you know, the next time I'm there in a couple of weeks. Mm. Yeah, look, I, I think um, that would have affected me as well, you know. Um, you know, particularly with kids, <clears throat> um, there's a, this nurturing thing that comes out in me personally. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure most instructors, I mean, you know, we we all, not many of us get, get paid for what we do and... Um, and even the ones that do will tell you that they don't really make much money anyway once they pay all the bills. Right. But um, right. but the thing is, you do it because you genuinely care for this kid. You know, you, you, you know that you've got something really, really cool that you want to share with them. Um, and, you know, and, and like I said, it's not just the, the physical, you know, almost violent aspect of what we do. It's, it's actually far, far more than that. But, um, you know... When those sort of things happen, it is really a bit of a smack in the face. It's like, man, do you even realise that, you know, I'm giving my time freely to help your child be better? I don't know this kid, but I'm helping him, you know? There's not many people in society that would do that, period, for anybody. Right. Right. And to me, so, it's, a, mm. it's a commentary on, mm. on society. Why are we at the point where this guy was that concerned, you know, even in a place that is traditionally mm. safe, safe for kids, you know, how much fear may be going on in his life? You know, I, I don't know his past. I don't know any of that. But obviously, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned your age, you're 45, I'm 38. The world has shifted since we were children. Mm. Do, do you um, do you have working with children's... Um, they're, they're a... They're a uh, safety check that we have in Australia, which basically anyone that works with kids, it's mandatory that we have, you know, Boy Scout leaders from uh, nurses working with uh, people under the age of 18 in hospitals, um, teach any, any, anyone that has interaction with children in an environment where they, um, you know, where they are potentially um, the only supervisor of these children um, need to have a, a government, um, I guess it would be a government overseen body. Um, it's called a working with children's certification, and there's a twelve monthly thing. Do you have that over there? We, we don't. Uh, some I've seen some schools that will advertise that all of their instructors have had background checks, <clears throat> but even okay. those background checks are, to my knowledge, exclusively private. You know, there's there's nothing mm. there's nothing well, well, federal yeah. happening there. Mm. Okay, with here, it, this is a national initiative, mm. um, and you know, obviously, you know, it only flags things that would be deemed to be a risk, um, 
so say for instance you didn't pay a hope of traffic fines and you got you know a suspended jail sentence from that that's not going to flag as someone as a risk to children um so you know it's but basically they, they go through any criminal history and they they will they will um they deem you either suitable to, to be a a carrier of this card or or, or unsuitable and if you're unsuitable mm. you can't get a job in, in an industry that works with kids period yeah. um so you know you have to find another profession right but but well, what, I, what, I sorry, my point my sorry sure go, go ahead go ahead Oh, my point is this, you know, we, I, I carry carry one of those. Obviously, with my job, I need one, but also with um, with my karate classes, but also my instructors do as well. Um, I, I think it's just an extra little uh, safety measure, um, and, and the reason I'm saying this is that you said that you know culturally, um, you know, this guy's obviously had fear. There's obviously something, you know, for him to to, to have such a reaction triggered. Um, immediately and and sort of abruptly by the sounds of things um i think you know there's obviously something that's happened you know this this is you know not the first time that something like that's happened and he's like well this time i'm really going to step up right you know if you want to get really right. psychological psychological maybe it happened to the parent <laughs> and he's like no one's ever messing with my kid you know sure sure you know it's you know, I spent a lot of time unpacking it, you know, and ultimately, um, cool. you know, that evening I, I talked to my instructor about it and, and you know, he was, he was floored, um, you know, cause he and I go back a, mm. you know, a good 10 plus years, 12 years now. Yeah. And, you know, he knows me, you know, he, he knows I have nothing but the best of intentions for the kids, mm. but he, you know, you know, and, and unfortunately mm. that's not the case for everyone. You know, if you. Um, one of the things that that we do at Whistlekick for for social media purposes is we monitor news articles related to karate, taekwondo, kung fu, etc. Mm. You know, pretty much every, any style and any other kind of buzzword that might yep. warrant some article worth checking out. Mm. And a huge percentage of them are martial arts instructors being accused or convicted of abusing kids, usually sexually. You know, and and it it just it it sickens me on two levels. You know, it sickens me because of the actual thing, and then it sickens me because here is is something that I love, martial arts, something that has has you know changed my life for the better, and so many other people getting mm. a bad name. Of course, because you don't of want to become else. like a Catholic priest. We don't want to be second to the Catholic right. priest. Right, that's a that's a perfect you know? example. That's a it's a um, that's a beautiful example. For example, you know, you, you, I'm not sure what religion you grew up with, but um, you know, you, I grew up I, I, Catholic, mm. um, and and I'm sure there's lovely Catholic priests everywhere, but I would not entrust my son, who's six years old, um, in an environment where they were unsupervised with a Catholic priest, and this is not an individual attack. I'm saying this is. Obviously, yeah, you've got, you know, you've got the mass media sort of, you know, reporting these things. But you know, this, all these c cases um, that have come forward, um, I, it's it's really tainted that whole thing. So I'm like, I, I just, you know, I, I just would not risk that with my child. Now, you're saying this. Um, I have not heard of any cases in, in Australia. Um, I'm not saying that they haven't happened. I just haven't heard of them. Um, but I would hate to be the next level of that. You know, parents saying, just make sure I'm in the room all the time with this guy. Just in case yeah. he is one of those, you know, in case he yeah. is one of those bad ones, you know. Well, and I don't think too many people mm -hmm. are going to put in that much effort. You know, just like you said, you know, it... it you're just not going to take your six-year-old to a Catholic church and leave him alone with a priest. Exactly. You know, people tend to err on the side of caution. So my my fear, my concern is that, you know, enough of those articles mm. pop up yep. that it starts to skew <clears throat> what we're doing. Exactly. You know, you, you American pit bulls, um, you know, there was a, a whole you know spate of them attacking kids um, over here probably 10 years ago, mm. <clears throat> and more recently picking a dog 
um, and we we end up getting a staffy. But you know, there's no way you'd ever entertain getting an American pit bull. Um, there could be millions and millions of great American pit bulls, but why would you risk the fact that you might get that bad one with your kids? See, that's you know? interesting so, because. We had the same thing over here, but it was longer ago. And it was long enough ago that we're in the midst of this kind of counter movement. And yeah, people like, are. Hey, give, yeah, give them a go. Are, give them a go. You, well, Facebook, at least, you know, the people in the, the pages I follow, there are frequent videos of pit bulls and other supposedly, you know, vicious dogs with infants or kittens or you know just in situations that just seem so unlikely mm. for the the reputation and and i wonder mm. you know it, it'll be curious to see if you know in the next 10 20 years if that happens over there too but i mean we, we're talking in a big circle to get to where we were going with that but um <laughs> but you seems right. to be our style it's, it, it's, it's that tainted um you, you, it's basically you know, fix it before it gets to that point, you know. Um, so, you know, I like to think that in, in Australia with this working with children's uh, checks that the, you know, the government do, that um, I, I think that is, um, that's a, a step in the right direction, hmm. you know, because um, they're quite extensive background checks. Um, you know, mind you, it mightn't mean that you're that good. It just might might mean that you haven't been caught yet, <laughs> you know. But right. but the thing is, but it, it's something. It, at least they're doing something. They're doing something, right. you know. Um, you know, if you had any offences um, related uh, or charged, you know, charged to you that are related to children, then you you'll never get one of these checks, and you can never ever work in that area. Mm. So yeah, you know, just talking. Um, about the young kid that you you know you the uh, the situation with the parent, I, I actually you know I, I think people look at uh, martial arts instructors you know and, and they think you know, parents are, and, and I can just tell by you know their choice of words and dialogue and you know that they think that you're this invincible you know tough man and and obviously it's a lot of the uh, social conditioning to you know. Bruce Lee movies and John Claude Van Damme, and they think you know we're going to kill <laughs> kill four people with one kick. Um, but they they tend to forget that we are humans, and the fact that we're giving so much of our time freely um, generally would indicate that we are actually uh, sensitive, mindful, giving people. You know that we are probably. Um, almost airing on the sides of uh, soft, um, you yeah. know, soft of heart. Um, now, so so when they say things, you know, they, they probably think that it rolls off us like water of a duck's back. But, you know, I had an incident a few years ago where um, I had a kid that um, I'd spent um, six years training. And, and as you know, these kids become like family, you know, they, they become an extension of your family. And that's the way I like to teach um, and you know, uh, you know that, that these kids, I'm, I'm partaking in in their education and making them better people for the future. You know, um, so I take that really seriously. But um, mm. there was a kid who was getting up into the higher ranks, um, and and as I touched on before, in Kyokushin, the higher you get, the more the more is expected. Um, and he was turning up, you know, once or twice a week. And and I spoke to him and and his father and said, look, I would like to see um, to see this guy, to see your boy um, partake in some more classes and some self-directed training outside of class, you know, because that's the level you're getting at. You need to start pushing yourself outside of what I'm spoon-feeding you. Um, and he says, well, well he, he only plays cricket and he plays soccer and he does all these other things. So are you saying that he needs to give up those things? And I said, no, 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 I'm not saying he needs to give up those things. I'm saying... <clears throat> for him to move to the next level, he needs to make a decision um, around what's important. So mm -hmm. he, you know, he can stay stagnant at this level for years if he needs to. But currently, he's giving me maintenance time. He's just basically turned up enough to maintain current skill set. 
but he needs to lift it. Um, and to, to do that, this is what is required, right? So I gave the honest feedback and left it with them. Anyway, two days later, I, I get this email from the parent and it was just, it just gutted me. And it was basically saying, um, my son has lost all respect for you. Um, you know, we won't like, be attending your classes anymore. Um, that you told him he has to make a choice between, you know, karate or his sports and all these things. Um, and, um, you know, I thought to myself, and, th- and this is another thing where we reflect, I thought, if, if this kid has lost respect for me, his teacher, because of this one conversation, then I haven't done my job. You know, that, that was probably the biggest part of it. Um, Do you think that's what really kids. happened, though? Because that's that not what I'm here. <clears throat> oh, I'm, I'm not. I'm I'm hearing that the parent was upset because he heard that he needed to do more. That there was something lacking. You know that the, the mm-hmm. either they needed to carve out more time. You know, travel yep. more or, or or something. You know that there was something that forced the the father to question mm. what they had done for their child. You know, how, how old was mm. this, was this child? Um, he was about eight at the time. Okay. Um, yeah. He so must be in his teenage years now. So, I mean, an eight year old, I mean, they don't, they don't think in terms of respect. They think in terms of like or dislike, you know, and, mm. and I think, you know, whether or not that kid liked you. And oh, here yeah, you are, no, you're, you know, you're, you're, uh, you're trying to be honest with the parent to say if the kid's going to progress, mm. he needs more time. Mm. And I think so often parents are just stuffing their kids into these var- this variety of activities to keep them busy. <clears throat> you know, they're not thinking about mm. the longer term, you know, the, the phrase that I say on the show all the time, martial arts is the one thing that, you know, with six months of training will give someone lifelong benefit. You know, maybe on some level he recognized, hey, martial arts is a good thing. I want him to have some martial arts. Maybe there was some, I mean, there's a multitude of of possibilities. Mm. But just the way you expressed it was was absolutely, the to me, the father feeling like he had failed in some way and his Mm. unwillingness to accept that. Wow, that's really shed some light on it. I should pay you some um, <laughs> some sort of session fee, I think, um, because <laughs> I, I've been you know, this for years, um, and you know, and and even it's affected my decision making now because when I go into these conversations now, and, and, and as an instructor, you know, we have an obligation to be honest, upfront, and you know, forthcoming with our students. Um, you know, as an instructor, I think you need to go and just be as upfront as you can. But the thing is, now I sort of think just hold back a little bit, be a little bit more understanding, be a little bit more forgiving, be a little bit more sort of flexible when I'm having these conversations because of that incident. I don't want to lose more students because, um, you know, you because know, I have taken it personally as if, well, maybe my delivery wasn't quite good. And, you know, and I'm thinking, wow, if he doesn't respect me because of that one conversation, I failed to teach him what that was, what respect was for a teacher, you know, um, I, I yeah, look, but the thing is, I think um, you've shed a whole new light on this um, topic for me because I've always took it as, you know, the father is speaking on behalf of the child. This is what the kid's telling him. But, yeah, you're right. Eight-year-olds, they either like yeah. you or they don't. They're not going to sit around yeah. and go, hmm, what's the philosophy behind this? <laughs> right. When we think about the stuff that bothers us, <clears throat> it, it can only bother us if there's some – credibility to it if i tell you you know man you stink as a human being because your skin's blue mm, that is that's blue. gonna roll you've never met your... me but you know that <laughs> <laughs> fine okay green right you know if i say something that is just so ludicrous it's mm. gonna roll off your back and you're gonna wonder what's wrong with me yeah but if yeah, i yeah, make yeah. you know i'm i'm five seven i'm a bit sensitive because I, i'm i'm smaller mm. You know, then a lot, then most of my friends, by mm. statistically, my most men, there mm. I've, you know, <clears throat> I've got a, a 
pretty good self-esteem. But if someone yep. makes some crack about my height, that's going to sink in a little bit because it's valid, because I give it some credibility. Yeah, yeah. It's something that you can't change. And so this, this guy got upset because something in what you said exposed some kind of gap for him. There was some, there was credibility in what you were saying that resonated in a way that made him feel inadequate. And rather than try to deal with the issue, mm. he walked away. I mean, and, and so many people do that, right? You know, how many people, you know, look at divorce rates. I mean, look at, there, there's so many examples. People don't want to do the hard work on themselves mm. and they'll yep. instead just extract themselves from situations. Oh my, you, you're spot on because the thing is, I mean, and, and just talking about kids, <clears throat> I mean, it's just drive through society. We live in these days, you know, where instant gratification, I see, I see these ads, you know, um, black belt in six months, you know, um, guaranteed, you know, you know, all these, all, all this sort of, um, garbage that is out there um you know and usually i make the comment um i hope that's not offensive to some of your um listeners well i hope that was offensive to some of your listeners because um <clears throat> yeah but the thing is that this instant gratification society you know and we we do put that on to our kids um you know like i said i've got a six-year-old and and i'm trying to i try to be mindful of the fact that you know if he wants to take up football um he's going to give that a really good shot i want him to do it for at least one year um, and and give it give it a good go and and see how he feels about it and then we'll discuss it. Um, and and I'm on the same mindset as you with with martial arts. So I think it's a one stop shop shop. I think all those things. I, I reckon give away everything else you're doing and just find a good good instructor and a good club and go and train martial arts. Put your kids into that because that will give them all the benefits that they get from everything else. But um, you know. We often see, you know, kids. You know, look at you, you know, kids at Christmas time. They get all these things. Half of them end up in the boxes, and and I'm talking from personal experience. My son, you know, he'll be opening things three months after Christmas, going, oh, I haven't opened this one yet. Um, you know, so it's it's turn around and it's total, it's consumption, consumption, consumption. But those old values of basically giving something a really good shot to see if it's good for you or good for your kid, that, they're things that we're really moving away from these days. And it's making it more and more difficult as a traditional martial arts instructor to, um, to attract people to that. You know, when there's some guy down the corner saying, you know, I can give your kid a black belt. You know, I know they're six, but by the time they're seven, they'll be a second dad. Um, you know, they don't know the difference. And, for, and to these people, a black belt's a black belt. But, um, you know, the Egyptian pound is worth a lot less than the uh, than the British pound. <laughs> they're both a pound, but, you know, so they're not the sure. same value, though. Sure. Um, <clears throat> do, do, you, do you have the same problems in, in, in America? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's... You know, because, and I've talked about this on the show, because we spent so long as a community, the, the martial arts world spent so long holding up the black belt as the Pinnacle. standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. It's done two things. It's allowed for that kind of junk marketing Yep. to say, you know, earn your black belt in X time. But it's also created a situation, and, and you've likely seen this, where people get their black belt and they don't get their second degree. No. Because we've told no. them for so long, mm. this is what this is the standard. This is where you're supposed <clears throat> to get to. I tell you what, it's a scary. Yeah, you know, and you would have found the same thing. It's a very, it's a scary level to be at, to be at um, black belt level, um, because the first thing you realize is that you don't know much. Um, and you're expected to teach others this little bit of nothing that you know, <laughs> you know. Um, but you know, in in uh, traditional Japanese martial arts, the the level of the of a black first degree black belt is shodan, um, and I think we spoke about this last time we spoke. But uh, you know, shodan means the 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 level of a beginner. It's the beginner's level, um, and I try to put this together for my students, and I say. You know, in the Q grades, it starts at 10 and goes backwards to 1 before you go for your black belt. So it means that you're less than 
less than a beginner times 10 before you when, when you start and you count down until you become a beginner at a black belt level um and then your dan ranks start moving upwards from there obviously you know you know all this but um you know so say Iyama, one of his famous sayings were that um you become a beginner after doing every technique 10,000 times. And <clears throat> and I told you that we... Um, I sat there one time and calculated that. And 10,000 times, just say you take any one technique, how many... You know, just training three times a week um, would take you roughly four years hmm. um, to do every technique around 10,000 times. <clears throat> so think about that. Between four to five years, it takes you to get a, a black belt in, in Kyokushin. Um, so... That makes sense. You become a beginner after practicing an event. He had like a secret code saying, this is, you know, when you get your black belt, now you can start. Now you start your journey. But um, I found it absolutely petrifying becoming a black belt because these expectations are there. And you actually we used to look at all the black belts that used to teach me and I'd think, oh, those guys know everything. But... um you know, no, no disrespect to my, you know, past instructors, but when I got to that level, I realised they just knew a bit more than me. Mm. Um, I had a slightly different perspective. Um, yeah, and I want to hear and it. I, I haven't thought about this in this <clears throat> way until you brought this up, and it, it's kind of interesting. From so I, I was the, when my original instructor started their school. I was there day one. I started. I was four years old, and and they said after me they would never take anyone under six. It was, a, it was a disaster. You ruined it for everyone. I, I did. I really did. You ruined it for everyone, I, Mike. I, I developed really good stances by walking on the knots in the hardwood floors and seeing how far I could stretch my oh, little no. short legs between I can the imagine knots. your your report cards. Jeremy is a constant distraction to others in class. <laughs> I, I was ignored, I think, more than distracting. But... Okay. Early on, I want to say within the first year, this this gentleman named Gene started class, and mm. he became our first black belt. He trained all the time. I mean, he karate became his thing. I mean, he was there. We had classes twice a week, and he was there yeah. twice a week, and he was training at home and just really excelled at it. And mm. I want to say he earned his his shodan in in let's say five to six years. Yeah. And at the time, I was. You know, so six years, I would have been, you know, 10. I would have been a green belt. And I remember standing there, the class after he got his black belt with my mother and my mother asking him, she had, she had started training. She'd been training for four years at that point. What does it feel like to be a black belt? And he said, I realized how much I didn't know. <laughs> and so yeah. I was just old enough to kind of wrap my brain around the surface of that and i carried yeah. it with me and i remember growing up with that and and just and that knowledge so when when i tested for and earned my black belt i was already aware of how little i knew and the epiphany for me was at black belt was not only is there so much i don't know that i've actually reached a point with my ability to process information to learn what I don't know mm. is actually greater than my ability to learn the, the information. I will n not only will I not know everything now or ever, but over time there will be even more that I don't know. And that was hard. You uh, reached a, an enlightenment. I don't know that I put that strong <clears throat> a word on it, but... <laughs> I, I mean, uh, well, my my, you know, my humility won't 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 let me agree with you. Well, you know, but but what it what that did that shows is a, a tremendous uh, uh, sense of maturity. Um, and and um, last time we spoke, we spoke about ego, um, and and and. Ego and maturity, I think, go hand in hand. But age and maturity don't go hand in hand. <laughs> age has no bearing on maturity. But 
It sounds like, <clears throat> you know, I, I manage a, a, a team of people here at the hospital. And um, it's really, it's, it's great to have a conversation with someone about their own performance. Um, and they have an insight into that. You know, they, they, they have an insight into the fact that they do need to improve those things. Um, and that's maturity. I think that's maturity to understand, to know what you don't know. You know, it's kind of, kind of like what you said before. Um, there, then there's the other category of person that doesn't foresee any weakness or any improvement needed in themselves. And any perceived issues are with others. It's like, I, no, 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 it's not me. It's that other person that did that. And those people are almost unfixable. It's, it's like it, you can't break out of that mindset with them. They have to come to that conclusion. And I think it's similar in martial arts, you know. Um, you know, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And I found that to be this, I don't know if I want to say the secret, but that is the thing that I drive towards. Like if I, if I get somebody on the phone, if I'm hiring a new service provider or interviewing them or, or, or something, I will ask them that question directly. What are the things that I don't know that I don't know? And not all of them understand my words. So I'll come mm. back with it and say, what are the things that other people in my position don't realize they should be asking you? And I end up with amazing stuff from that. Mm, that I mean, I, I imagine a lot of people wouldn't understand that question because you have, you have to be a lateral thinker to actually understand <laughs> even the question, <clears throat> sure. you know? You can't be a concrete thinker that just can't, you know, you actually have to be a little bit creative with the way that you would answer that, I guess. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold no. at the moment. Um, Quite all right. Sorry, is there a, a delay in the... Uh, no, no, I, I, <laughs> I was just making sure, just seeing You've if there was anything that. that you wanted to say. No, 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 no. Um, well, let, let me ask for... you that question then. Yes, go ahead. When you th when you think about your students, and let's yes, I I want to I want to ask you this kind of as as four levels. Let's think about you know your novice, your intermediate, your advanced, and your black belt students. What is it that they don't know that they don't know at each level? You know, they will generally. I, I'm assuming that as you consider it, they'll figure it out, you know, when a, when someone, do you go, uh, white, yellow, blue, green, brown? Um, we go, um, so it's orange or red, depend what's, what stream of Kilchin, blue, yellow, green, brown. Okay. So if you consider, <clears throat> you know, from, from white to green, there's a, there's a lot that's going to happen there. Mm. Right. What is it that the white belt doesn't know that they don't know that as a green belt, they either know <clears throat> or they learn to be able to ask. I, I think, um, so with, with the beginner, I guess in, in everything, um, I've sort of recently taken up golf and, um, it's probably, you know, they say golf is a good way to ruin a good walk. But, um, it's, uh, it's so similar in, to martial arts in so many ways that I was, mm. I was actually taken aback because I was like, wow, this is martial arts with um, a different kind of weapon, you know. But the, the, the thing is, when you start off something, and, um, you know, like I said, my new journey is with golf, <clears throat> excuse me, but um, if you start off, the, the thing is that you don't realise is that the difference between you and your instructor is very small, yet at the same time, it's the Grand Canyon. Um, and, and I'll embellish on that a little bit more because basically, you know, when when they come in here, they, they look at me, I've got a black belt on, I've got all these gold bars and it, oh, it looks very cool. And their perception of that is that this is a someone that must be able to do some really crazy techniques and you know could do a double for a stunt man on a martial arts film <laughs> but the thing is i've got two arms and i've got two legs um and i have honed 
the very, very discrete differences in the way I use those weapons um, to the beginner. And like I said, so they're only small differences, but it took me a long time to make them. So that's what I'm saying. It's a very small thing and it's a very large thing at the same time. And um, they, they are interlinked. Does that... I'm trying. See, you've got me with a question today that I'm not sort of. Uh, I wasn't prepared for. So I'm trying to articulate this. That, that's okay. That's okay. I I get what you're saying. You know, not all the listeners yeah. may, but as we talk about this as a concept, you mm. know, my my hope is that the folks listening will take that concept and kind of you know look at their own lives. What is it I don't know that I don't know? Yep. Mm. And I think once you look at the world, at least in part through that lens, you start to seek out the people who can show you the things you yep. don't know that you don't know. Well, I, I just needed to link this back to the golf scenario, is that I would watch golfers. I was always fascinated with golf for some reason. Most people, or a lot of people would find it actually quite boring, but it's so skilled. Um, it's, it's quite zen, actually, um, because yeah. very, you know, the stances that they use are very similar to martial arts, the way that they move and manipulate their, their body mechanics. It's very similar. But, um, so I'd look at it and I'd go, wow, there's such a huge difference between someone that is playing, you know, you know, PGA something and then, and, and me, but, um, you know, doing it for now for a couple of years, um, and understanding coming from a, a martial arts background, I know that the people that have taught me, they're only doing very slight different, you know, very slightly different movements. I mean, because it's really, it's, swing, it's swinging a hammer. You know, it's not, you know, there's only certain, certain ways that I can manipulate my body to emulate what they're doing. But there's, there's fractions and fractions of differences between the way that they do it and the way I do it. But they can drive it, you know, X amount of yards, and I'm lucky to be able to drive it in a straight line for you know, ten meters. But um, but the thing is, this the difference is that they have spent the time and the effort to hone those very slight differences, and that what the, that's the Grand Canyon. That that's where the discipline and the you know the time and effort and sweat and blood has gone into. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how much blood is in um, golf, but Sure, there is occasionally. Mm, yes, hopefully. Well, when I play golf, generally there's blood, but it's mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> what what have you taken from your golf back into martial arts? Well, the thing is now when I'm talking to students, and you know, I'll talk, I'll say, "Who's played golf here?" And you know, you know, maybe thirty percent of the class will stick their hand up, and I reckon the others are probably embarrassed to say that. <laughs> but you know, so the first thing, what you do, have you ever hit? Do you play golf, Jerry? I don't. I I used to play you, a fair amount of mini golf. Uh, terribly. Yeah, man. You know, have I, you ever gone can, to the driving range putt. and tried to belt a ball at the driving range? Once. Yeah. And I bet you did this. I bet you got there, you got the biggest club out of the bag, you put the ball down on the tee, and you tried to just absolutely smash it and drop the uh, the skin off it. Yeah, right. There's and this, ego and this at is stake. A, this, this is a white belt. You know that 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 counterproductive. Mm. It's like they're trying so hard and they're so committed to uh, downing an opponent, and they're putting a hundred percent of effort into that. But they're actually counterproductive because all their muscles are locking up. You know, they're not breathing breathing correctly. They everything is working against them being good at that, even though they're trying so hard. The only thing that is really working well is their their mind. The body's not 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 uh, trailing behind. Um, so with golf and with martial arts, I found that the more relaxed I was, the more I tried to forget about the technique, the, accent, the, the better it is. So, you know, it's just a simple thing like throwing a right cross. Um, if I have to think about keeping my guard up, keeping my, my um, elbow in, you know, keep my jaw low, aim, you know, putting eyes on target, all those sort of things, um, you know, dropping the hit to support, all, you know, driving it up from the ground – if I think about all those aspects, it's actually quite overwhelming. Um, and this is where it goes from a martial science to the martial art, you know, um, where, you know, the, the science of it is actually doing 
you know, dot one joins up to dot two, dot two joins up to dot three, and it goes through, and, and it's a scientific approach until it becomes a an art form where it's actually free thinking. You know, you're not think, you, you're not thinking about the aspects, and that's what I've taken back from golf. Is that you know, um, obviously the body mechanics are very similar for generating power, but um, but to to try to knock the skin off the ball is probably the worst thing and my job is to, to actually try to strip away all that to the point where the student feels as relaxed as um not you know the thought process is not going through the fundamentals is just letting it happen but there is a there are stages where you need to go through all those steps until they become like you're talking about teaching kids you know where they become, where it becomes a natural, fluid sort of motion. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I've that's what I've taken mm. away from my golf, and and and, and people that have hit a golf ball before can understand that, <clears throat> because you know when I hit a pad these days, and when I try to get my students to do or kick or headbutt, what are you doing? Relax and not having a thought process behind the actual, you know, because of a response. It's not. It's you know, it's a response to a technique. You're reacting. Um, is it will give you a far stronger technique. Does that answer your question? Yeah, gives me a few more. <laughs> <laughs> I knew. So you, the thing is, when I'm speaking, you're thinking, "Great, there's another question." I know you're writing. Yeah. I can hear you writing these questions well, down. A little going, bit. Yeah, I got, this I is going to get. This is going to get in. I just made that up. I just made that no, up. I caught I, you I, out. Of course, of course, I got pen and paper. I know, what, in case one of us flubs, I got to write down what time it was so we can we can go back and edit it, make us both oh. sound like pros. Right. Yeah. Okay. I, I thought like um, you know you were just writing down things to sort of hold against me at a later date. <laughs> well, last time we spoke, Dave, you actually said this, <laughs> which is I, I do I do have that pe- I do have that piece of paper. Um, let's see what what it, what it, was there anything? No, no. no. <laughs> Yeah. What, I, what, what I wanted to follow up, yeah. what I wanted to follow up and ask was around relaxation because it's such a tough thing to teach, and yet, you know, here we are, we're talking, and it it's it's kind of core to development, and you know, if the the earlier we can teach it, I think the faster people progress. Mm. So how cool. how do you teach it in your school? What's what's your strategy for? Work and relaxation, getting people to just you know stop knocking the skin off the ball, so to speak. Yep. Um, it's, it's funny, you know. I had I had a um, you know, one of my guys recently uh, who went for his second degree um, black belt, and we're going through Carter with him. Um, and 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 <clears throat> for second day in Kilkshin, it's a it. It's had close to twenty plus Carter. You need to know. Um, forms um, for for that test, and that's only one aspect of it. But he was finding it, uh, as you can imagine, you know. After a while, they start to blur in. You know, you're like, oh, oh is that oh, yeah. this one or is that that one? And because they, they're similar movements, and there's not really much difference between a lot of them. Uh, as in, um, you know, you can only do a certain amount of techniques and throw it in and go, oh, that's a new Carter. Um, so he was getting quite sidetracked um and and what happened is he was becoming counterproductive because he's overthinking you know like i was saying with the white belt he was overthinking he's like oh okay then left leg goes there right leg goes there you know left hand does a, a para you know blah 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 and and i was thinking when i was training this guy i think wow okay what are we going to do about this so what i said to him is um oh your rhythms all off and he said oh okay what's that mean i said what i want to do is i'm gonna i just want to to put a rhythm out, I want to play a rhythm for you, just clapping. And I want you to do kata to, um, to this rhythm. Mind you, you shouldn't be doing kata to any rhythm other than an internal one. <laughs> but anyway, um, <clears throat> so what I'd be doing is clapping out, and he was concentrating so hard on this, um, this rhythm that after about three or four kata, I said, um, guess what? He said, oh, what? And I said, uh, you haven't made one mistake. And he said, oh, wh- why do you think that is? And I said, because you're not thinking about it. You, you, were, you, were, you were just focused on the rhythm that I'm putting out. 
and the task, and you just then you're just moving, you're flowing through it. You should, you know, Carter shouldn't be a thought out process. You know, it's it's a step between you know Carter and the next the next level of um, you know of, of, of Kumite and stuff. So you know he, um, I, I think that was a really good lesson. Hmm. I've actually had some some fun and I think some benefit working kata to music. You know, it's not something that happens too often in schools, and I, I think that's unfortunate because it can shut off people's minds and let them kind of flow into it, as you know you're you're talking about there. But I think for for people that may find forms a, a little bit too. <clears throat> I, I'm I'm anxious I'm anxious to validate, you know I'm not I'm, I I don't really want to validate this, but you know folks that really don't jive with doing forms, it can mix it up enough that <clears throat> you know they're 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 open to putting you know putting their hundred percent back in. Look, I think this is an age old question you have just raised there. Um, you know, can you teach a contemporary martial art? And have uh, large aspects of um, traditional stuff in there as well. You know, I, th- I think those aspects can turn students away from your club um, if it's not explained to them. Uh, and and if, generally, if it's not explained to them, um, you know, that could indicate that the instructor doesn't know why they're doing it. So I think as an instructor, you have to know your business you have to know why you are teaching every aspect um and you have an obligation to do that because you know unless you want to go out and start your own style um if you're teaching a syllabus you you know you have to teach not only teach your your students you know things like you know forms um for their you know for their grading requirements but you, you have to show them what the benefits of that is um, and you know, come back to the good meal thing. You, you're giving them aspects of um, karate or taekwondo or whatever they're doing. Um, a, it separates you from a kickboxer, you know, because kickboxing Muay Thai is generally aimed at a ring ring sport. Okay, so it's a sport. It's not designed for um, street application, although I, I'm sure it would be quite effective. But it's not designed for multiple attackers. It's not designed for really anything but um, dropping someone in the ring. Um, where you know a true Budo martial art should cover all aspects of the student's needs. Um, as the parent, you know, the, and I look at myself as as a parent sort of figure as a teacher. Um, I also have to teach my students things that they probably don't understand yet, or they mightn't understand until they're black belts. Um, so, you know, if they want to do, you know, Kyokushin or whatever style they're doing, and that's a part of the syllabus, not only should they le- learn it and, and learn it as good as everything else, but the instructor has an obligation to teach them that, um, you know, what, what that is, why they need to know those things. Um, and we've spoken before about, um, what I believe is the amnesia of karate, um, where, you know, we've forgotten a lot of our history. Um, and so say Masuyama designed Kyokushin. Um, and he designed a system that was not intended for the ring. You know, we've, we've moved pretty much towards sports karate in the last 20 or so years, you know, and, and ring application, almost like Muay Thai, you know. Um, and maybe Muay Thai was actually designed originally for self-defense, but um, we've moved so far away from, um, I guess, our origins, our roots. And our roots were really set in, um, so say, um, designing a style that was rounded and, I guess, one of the first forms of a mixed martial art. He wanted to have, um, he wanted to be undefeated, not just in the ring, anywhere. Against any, any, you know, against judo players, against wrestlers, against boxers, he wanted to be able to get in, mix it up, and beat everybody. So he did design a style that was um, just sports karate. He he wanted to have a rounded style. So he, you know, he kept things in that would design that were were applicable to someone putting their hands on you. 
you know, if someone wants to put their hands up and and have a you know and slug it out, then 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 I suggest that you take it to that level as well. And and probably chances are that you're going to be, unless you're a trained fighter, you're going to have a, a you know quite an advantage. But um, you know, kata and the the bunkai application of kata, um, you'll find largely is applied to when people are putting hands on in a jiu-jitsu stand-up situation. So with my students, I make sure that we do know that when we're doing a kata, that is that is the second aspect of our fight game. One is stand-up and be a striker. The other one is being a standing grappler. And that is what, what our kata is. And that's, you know, when we apply that, when we, you know, when we understand it and we... we um, teach our students how to put that in a real situations. I'm not talking about these situations where, you know, you've got six guns trained on you and you take them all out with this, you know, Carter ap- application. I'm talking about just someone putting arms on you, you know, and, and just a standard, you know, you know, an a- outside block, and I'm sure you do something very similar. And they've got two hands on you and you just stand back into a forward leaning stance and go smash. You know, there's not many guys that are going to be able to stand up to that. And if they are, then you go to plan B. But as soon as someone put hands on, that's when your, your carta a- applies. Does that make sense? It does. It does. And, and I hope those of you out there, whatever side of the kata debate you come down on, you'll you'll consider what Sensei's saying here because it, it's there's no right answer. You know, I, I've I say that all the there's time. Not, there's not. There's not. But. You've got to consider reason- all the different perspectives to find to to re- if if you're going to say you know what you believe you have to be able to to temper that belief with all we'll of the possible it. arguments yeah mm. I mean that's what we test do with it. martial arts right you know I mean mm. it, it, bad martial think- arts don't tend to get handed down well no yeah that's right and I've got a big problem with uh, martial arts making claims that have never been tested. <laughs> you know, I think if you if you really think um, what you're teaching is effective, and we have an obligation to be teaching techniques that we know are tested to our students, because you know, as a parent, as a as a leader, as a mentor, we're teaching people. Um, you know, we're not teaching needlepoint. We're teaching people how to you know to potentially defend their life. Um, and some of the the rubbish that is getting handed on has never been tested. Um, it could get some people killed. So I'm, I'm saying if people are convinced, if they're convicted by the fact that they're teaching something legit, put it in the ring. Put Jump in the ring with a Muay Thai guy. You know, get, come along to a Kyo Chin tournament and, and just say, look, I'd like to fight one of your guys. You'll find out if it works. And if it works, I'll steal it. <laughs> and I'll put it in my <laughs> system. Um, and that's how it should be. Well, exactly. You know, um, I, I was watching a, on a, a, a online interview with um, a gentleman named Cameron Quinn Sheehan, who is a, uh, a pioneer of Kyokushin in Australia and has written a couple of books around it. But, um, you know, he, he was saying that um, so say before he died, and this you've got to understand that, uh, Cameron Quinn Sheehan was a uh, personal interpreter um, and personal assistant for Sose Oyama. So, you know, he was probably as close as anyone was to him. Um, and, you know, this online interview, he was stating that, you know, he, he felt that um, Sose wanted to bring Kyokushin particularly into the new age and, um, you know, he wanted to continue to grow it and adapt and take new things. You know, Kyokushin in the 60s didn't have leg kicks or elbows the same as what we do now. So, say, saw the Muay Thai guys doing that and went, cool, let's take that. You know, and you can imagine these days with UFC and, you know, with the, you know, with the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys and that, I'm sure he would have said, oh, let's take some of those things and put it in as well because, you know, whatever works, use it. And if it doesn't work, scrap it. And I say to my students, if... If I'm teaching you something that you don't understand, how you can use this in a real combative situation, come and speak to me. And if I can't explain it, I will no longer teach it. I think you've got to have that commitment to, to your teaching. Yeah. That, Everything's you know, there for a purpose. It. Exactly.
exactly. It's got to be you there know, the for a pur- purpose. Otherwise, what, what are we doing? <laughs> right. And the purpose isn't always combat. You know, I don't know too many people that no, are going right. to set into a, a horse stance to fight. But we can no, explain I, the purpose I, of that. I've never seen that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what? I I remember when I was a young guy, and I was you know seventeen, eighteen, and and competing, and 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 really hungry for the fight, you know. And I really, really got off on um, jumping in and just pitting my skills against another male, you know. And and it's that testosterone. Mm-hmm. It's it's a part of who we are um, as humans, and and that that survival instinct, you know. I guess that's that's the the part of our life stage that requires us to be the fighters and the you know the hunters and collectors and you know so on and so forth but in in my older age i find that my enjoyable moments are with things like carter you know that um with things like just those fine details of of a certain stance and you know i'm not that interested in jumping in and trying to mix it up with a 22 year old who you know is probably a lot fitter than me um, a lot faster than me, um, and a lot hungrier than me as a as a fighter. Um, you know, um, I I find that martial arts, if if you've picked a good one, will follow you with your where you're at in your life. Hmm. I like that. We're coming to the end of our time. Yeah. Yeah, and this this has been a lot of fun, and and listeners and you, I mean, we we can we can tell I haven't really asked you any formal questions, none of our standard mm. set, because I learned last time talking to you that that it wasn't necessary. You know, we had a better chat, just kind of letting it flow. But there is one question that I I want to I want to ask of you as you look forward. You know, what's what are your goals? What's keeping you motivated? You know, you you mentioned that. You've just shifted to a full-time school, you know, so you're, yes. you're increasing your involvement in the martial arts rather than stepping back from it. Mm. Why? Mm. Because it's in my blood. <laughs> because I don't know my life without it. I mean, these are all things that yourself and a lot of your listeners could relate to. That um, When you find something that completes your life like this, you know, I guess, you know, if it's your wife your children, you know, uh, a sport. Um, and for me, you know, it's all the the above, um, including, you know, Kyokushin Karate. And I just found that it really filled a, um, an aspect of me that was lacking. And, and, it, and, and I'm so grateful for all the great things that it, that it has given me. And, and that's not physical contest. That's probably one percent of the hundred percent that it could have been. You know, um, like I said, if you're going to waste your time preparing for that one fight you might never have, then uh, take your chances. But um, you know, some of the toughest times I've had in my life, um, the only consistent thing has been my training has been Kyokushin and has been my my love for this and you know last time we spoke we spoke about you know training as a form of meditation which some people wouldn't understand but martial artists would that you know you go in for the hour and a half two hours whatever it is and you turn your brain off for that time and then you turn it back on and things just seem a bit better a bit fresher you have a different perspective on things um so I, I'm not stepping backwards and I'm not step, stepping forwards. I'm just, move, I'm just on the journey. I'm just, I'm just still moving in a direction. Um, my love for Kyokushin and my want and will to share that with other people um, has seen me realise a lifetime dream of having my own dojo, um, and that, and that's that's basically like like I'm saying. I don't think I don't feel like I'm moving. Um, more into it i just feel like it's a very natural step in 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 this direction you know um and you know i i i can't even see where i'll be in um 10 years time you know i'd like to have maybe a couple of dojos that i'm operating um i couldn't even see myself years ago becoming a black belt and you know now i'm looking at my fourth then so um that 
question has um, inspired so many thoughts from my head, and I'm trying to articulate that to you and and sort of formulate it into into a uh, into a response that actually makes sense to yourself and your listeners. But um, really, I think uh, onward and upwards. I I want to keep sharing it with more people, and and this has given me an opportunity to. Um, I keep on referring back to being a parent. But, you know, we, we try to give our kids, um, and I know, you know you haven't got kids yet, but you will one day, I'm sure. Um, we try to give them the life that we didn't have and give them the experiences that we didn't have. And I've been so lucky to have so many fantastic experiences in Kilkshin. Um, and I'm, I'm really wanting to give that, that opportunity to other people, but also enhance that, give them even more. Does that answer your question, Jerry? Sure does. And here we're kind of tying it up with things we were talking about earlier with yes, with the love, you know, the sharing mm. children. You know, we've, mm. we've come full circle. Seems like a, a good place to wind it down. This has been yes. a lot of fun. This is this is um, this has been kind of a well, you and I have done it now twice, but it's been a different episode than any other that I've done. And I've enjoyed it. Good. Hopefully Glad to hear that. To... Yeah, I, well. I um, my mind goes a million miles an hour, as you can tell. So, <laughs> and always. <go laughs> I think that's track. why we get along. <laughs> that's right. Because all, all your questions are well, well thought out. Whether you're thinking of them, um, in a way like, um, like, the way you plan out your class, you know, on the on the fly, on the way, or yeah. um, or you're putting together things and going, ah. This is where I can use that technique. I've been thinking about that for a while, but um, either way, they work. They work well. They're nice questions, and they uh, well, they definitely get the cogs going. And that, as as long time listeners know, that's all I'm trying to do is get people thinking. So thanks for coming on mm. and, and giving me stuff to think about. And no, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. I want to thank Sensei Hughes for coming back on the show for being patient with me. And really just having an amazing discussion. I admire your patience, sir, not only for the show, but just in the way you handle yourself with martial arts, with teaching kids, and you know, really just your your willingness to be so open with me, with the listeners, and with the others in your life. So again, thank you. If you want to check out the show notes with links to websites and social media and other stuff that we talked about today, the best place to find that, the only place to find that, as far as I know whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can check out other episodes. You can submit feedback, comment on the episodes. If you want to comment in a more private method, you can write to me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. You can check out our products at whistlekick.com. We are all over the place. And if you didn't know it, we sell our stuff on Amazon too. If that's more convenient for you, go ahead, buy stuff over there. That's all I've got for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'll talk to you soon. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.